Let's have another word of prayer real quick. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for this day, this opportunity for us to gather together. And Lord, as we open your word, I just pray for your presence here in a mighty way. And Lord, you would just open our hearts. Lord, teach us something new about you today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Who sinned? That's the question that was asked. Who's at fault? That's what they were after. This poor man's just standing there. The question's been as much a part of his life as the darkness has been. It's been there his whole life. He probably hears it at least once a day. He sits on the side of the road, hears some change go into his lap, hears the shuffling of feet. They get a little ways away, what they think's out of earshot of him. And somebody will ask, Who's at fault? Who sinned in this one? He heard it the whole time he was growing up. Kids came to him. Some of them were probably really curious, truly wanting to know why he was different. Some were just using it as a taunt or a tease because he was different than they were. Probably the most hurtful of all, he's heard his parents ask this. They thought he was in bed asleep. But he was awake and he heard his mom crying, saying, why? What happened that he was this way from birth? If we were to ask this gentleman today, of the two, blindness or the question, which would you rather not have in your life anymore? He would tell you, I can deal with the blindness. I've had it all my life, never seen anything. I've heard that it's wonderful, but I have no knowledge, have no experiences with it what I would rather is be blind the rest of my life if I could just get rid of the question because there is no answer to it as to who sinned or who's at fault here John's very loving here he says the disciples like they just broke out in unison asking this question here but we've been reading the gospels long enough we know who the king of inappropriate questions and comments is <laughs> This was Peter. It just sounds like something he would come up with. They're walking past this gentleman. Peter looks down. A thought goes through his head. It comes right out of his mouth. There is no stopping point between there. He says, who sinned? Lord, was it his parents? Was it him? We think we're so smart, modern today. 2,000 year old question here. Is it nature? Or was it nurtured? Which is it? We need an answer here. We've got to find out who's at fault. As Jesus is turning around, giving him that you used your outside voice again, Peter, look. He sees the other disciples. They're all wanting to know. Whether you believe it was Peter or not who asked the question, the rest of them were nodding their head. It's been a question that they've had as well. Whoever asked the question knew the man because they knew he had been born blind. Knew that this wasn't some kind of an accident. He had always been this way. Maybe Peter or whoever asked the question was one of those kids that asked him, why are you different? What happened to you? Whoever it was that asked, however well that they knew this young man, they have just handed Jesus this incredible teaching opportunity here. It's a Sabbath morning or a Sabbath day. I choose to believe that it was in the morning. They were actually on their way to temple. The temple can wait. This is an opportunity that doesn't come around. But every so often, Jesus looks at him. And while they're still there in the presence of the man who's standing there, he says, neither. This man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. This happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Jesus looked at him there, big grin on his face, and he said, you're asking the wrong question. The question's not who sinned. The question should be who saves. The question's not who's involved. It's who's the fix. That answer will get you going. The other answers won't. 
borrow a phrase from the meeting rooms, there is no future in looking back, is what Jesus was saying. As this revelation is hitting everybody here, this poor man, his entire life, he's been asked this question. He's been asking himself this question. Who sinned? Who's at fault? Suddenly he sees that it doesn't really matter. What he should have been pursuing was the Savior and the fix. As his upper level mental activity is going through all these gyrations, his lower level is hearing somebody spit on the ground. Wasn't near him, probably wasn't directed at him. He just blows that one off. He hears some clothes rustling, a knee pop. Somebody's bending down. Again, maybe tying a sandal or something. Nothing big. He hears some dirt being moved around. He thinks, oh, somebody's moving something here. Again, nothing really much to see, nothing much to think about. He's got all these other thoughts, and all of a sudden something warm, kind of gritty, a little soupy is being put on his eyes. And the man's not a rocket scientist, because we hadn't invented rockets yet. But it doesn't take one to figure out what just happened. Somebody made a mud pie and is now applying it to his eyes. This man's parents probably spent untold amount of money taking him to all kind of high dollar people in order to see if they could fix the issue that was with his eyes. He's probably had any number of exotic things placed on his eyes claiming that it was going to cure him, it was going to fix him, it was going to make him better. And here's somebody putting simple mud on my eyes. As he's thinking of this, this voice comes into his ears. It's a very warm, it's a very loving voice. He believes he heard it before, and he thinks that the name that they used was Rabbi. And his warm, loving voice simply whispers in his ear, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And that's it. No expectation, no promise that anything was going to happen. Just a simple request to wash this off now in this particular place. John is the only gospel that carries this incredible story. John speaks with such detail and such clarity to what happened here that I got to believe that when Jesus told him to go and the man's next thought is, how am I going to get there? Because the pool could be several blocks away. It could be across town. The John simply just excuses himself from the group. Says, y'all go on, I'll, I'll catch up to you later. And I think Jesus looks back at him and nods and says, yeah, you get this. You can go with him. Jesus never introduces himself to the man. But as they're going, this transformation happens. John writes that the man went blind. The man bathed or washed his eyes off being blind. But it says he came back seeing. And that's because you can't stay in the presence of the Savior, of the fix, and in your current state for any length of time. There's going to be a dramatic and incredible change that's going to occur in your life. Amen. And this man came back seeing. For the first time in his life, he's able to see things that we take for granted now. And the first place he wants to go is he wants to go see his mom. He's always wondered what she looks like. He's going to get a chance to actually now see her face to face. He wants to take a look at his dad. He keeps hearing from people that he looks just like him. He wants to get an idea now of what he looks like. And so John discloses that he runs there and everybody is astounded. Everybody's taken back. This is too big of a change for their little minds to get all wrapped around. And they keep asking him all these inappropriate questions. How did this happen? And he comes up with the name that was not given to him by the person speaking. I think it was John who was explaining on the way. He says it was Jesus who did this. He goes and he's trying to explain to his friends. He's trying to explain to his neighbors what has happened to him. How this change has come about in his life. And they just can't accept it. They don't understand what's happened. They take him to some smart people. They're called Pharisees. They'll know what to do. And so they bring him there. And the first thing they try to do 
is question whether he was really blind enough to begin with. Was he really sick enough to begin with? Maybe he was only just a little bit blind. And this wasn't that big of a deal. When they can't prove that any longer, they go to attack the person who did it. This poor man, he's only been seeing now for a couple of hours. He was expecting to see smiles. He was expecting to see joy for the first time. Actually see it and not just hear it in people's voices. And all he sees is shock and dismay. He sees a little bit of fear now in his parents as they're standing before these Pharisees. They come out. He's not seeing the smile on his mom. He's not seeing the pride in his dad. All he's seeing is fear. They decide, the Pharisees decide that what they'll do is they'll do a compromise here. Look with me here. Stay in John chapter 9 and go to verse 24. It says, A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man's a sinner. Go ahead and chalk it up to some big, cosmic, eternal, ethereal kind of being. Just a happy coincidence that happened in your life. Don't give any glory to Jesus. We're like Santa Claus. We know this man's bad. And the guy has had it at this point. He's only had a sight for a few hours and he just soon y'all take it back at this point. Because what he was expecting to see and what he's visually seeing now is not meeting up whatsoever. He's seeing pettiness. He's seeing jealousy. He's not seeing any smiles. He's not seeing any laughter. And he stands up. And the Pharisees think that they've got him at this point. That he's going to bow down. He's going to toe the party line. He's going to go ahead and just chalk this up to just some incredible coincidence that happened. And there was somebody by the name of Jesus who happened to be around. And the man stands up and he straightens his robes up a little bit. Maybe he looks down. And he sees that his clothes aren't nearly as nice as those Pharisees. They hadn't been where he's been. They're not as sun-faded as his have been sitting on the side of the road all those years. And he stands up and he looks him in the eye. And he says, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. That's, that's beyond my pay grade. I'm not even trying to consider that. Here's one thing I do know. One thing I do know. I was blind. And now I see. Explain that one, smart man. I met the fix this morning. I met the Savior. I don't ask myself the questions of why. I don't look back. I look forward. And that's how the Savior, that's how the fixer works best in us. you got to admit, this probably threw some people the wrong way. The resulting argument got him kicked out of the synagogue, which I would think he probably didn't consider that big of a loss. It wasn't like he was invited a whole lot to begin with. He got a chance to see it. He had always had it described to him. Now he got a chance. He's got those memories. He steps out, but he's very confused as to what has gone on today. This has been a very emotional, high, low, draining day. And there's a man walking toward him. And the man's smiling. And he thinks, finally, I get to see somebody now with a smile on their face. Yeah. Somebody that is at least seems happy to see me, although I couldn't tell you who he was from Adam. In verse 35 of John chapter 9, it says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe in the Messiah? Both the Bible and their tradition said that the Messiah, one of his witnessing characteristics was he was going to restore sight to the blind. The tradition came that nobody was going to be blind in Israel anymore. Physically blind, unable to see. And he said, yes. He said, who is he? Can you describe him to me? I can see him now. You just tell me what clothes he was wearing. 
I can find you. I can see you now. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And I believe Jesus leaned down close. Got right there so he could get a good look. And he said this. He said, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. That'd be me. And it says the man fell at his feet and worshipped him. The work of God is to believe in the one who sent. he sent. We've been looking the last several weeks here at step four. I didn't have them put out. Most of us know the steps by heart here. But you'll notice that step four doesn't say we whiningly came to God and asked him why we were like this. It doesn't say we ask who's at fault, who's the bigger one. Was it my sin or was it my parents who made me this way? Now it says we simply came and prayerfully asked him to take away these things that were between us and him. We were tired of where we were. Tired and we needed the fix. Tired and we needed the Savior. This story here is a beautiful illustration of what we call steps four, five, and six. Step five, after we've asked to take it away, it says we spend some time in prayer, study, small group, learning healing gospel truths, and then we come to accept Him as our Savior. We see this man here in dire need of physical healing in his eyes. Many of us blinded by other things, although we can see very well. We spent some time getting to know. We had those Johns in our life that took us maybe to a meeting, maybe to the pool, somewhere, and gave us a little instruction. And it ended with coming to know the Savior. I believe our step four is a needed part of our progression here. Will we quit looking back? We quit trying to figure out who's at fault for all the mess that's in us here. And we simply look for the fix. We simply look toward Jesus as that only one who can give us the future that we sometimes can't even imagine. Turn in your Bibles one last time. Can't read this story without going to 1 Timothy, please. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Both 1st and 2nd Timothy's very personal letters that Paul writes to his young protege. The young man that's been with him for 15, 16 years at this point. He's heard all these stories. 1st Timothy chapter 1. Somebody with a black Bible, power out a page number. 829. 829? Paul writes to him. Even though he knows the story, he's heard Paul say this so many times. But Paul somehow feels the need to write this down. In verse 15 of 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes, Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Deserves your full attention. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. But for that very reason, for that very reason, I was shown mercy. So that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display His unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on Him and receive eternal life. The question is not who sinned, who's involved. The question is, how can God get the most glory in my life? How can I best display this? I believe.